Good morning, everybody. Welcome to class. Good to see you for the board. Good morning. It is good to be back. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Appreciate Luke and uh, him filling in for me this past Wednesday, <clears throat> talking about the light of the gospel. And um, if you, um, yeah, if you haven't had a chance, if you weren't here for that, I encourage you to, to listen to that class. It was very, very well done. I appreciate Luke. Um, so we're going to spend some time this morning <clears throat> talking about this idea of how God can open the eyes of our heart. How does that happen? And why doesn't it happen for some? Um, so we, we obviously have natural physical eyes and we have a real heart, we have brains, and we know that there's some role they play, but I think all of us know that, that there's something more than just the natural eyes, ears, and brain. Um, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, we've quoted that. Ephesians 1, 18, that's one of the, that's one of the passages that we need to remember and, and memorize. It says something, again, it's, it, Apostle Paul puts it this way. The eyes of your heart enlightened that you may know. <clears throat> so Paul references this idea of eyes of your heart. <clears throat> so, you know, when we say, hey, I, you know, I really mean this from the heart. Um, or when we say, you know, I, I, I really feel in my heart something, we know that that's not, we're not referring to our physical beating, pumping heart. We know that. We, what, what it, when we say, I say this from the heart, or that when, when we talk about the eyes of our heart, what do we mean? What, what is, what is the, the Bible, what are the Bible writers, writers wanting us to understand? Okay. Okay. So you didn't understand. Now you do. Okay. So it, the, the the painting of knowledge and understanding and wisdom, all those things are part of uh, using our brains and those types of things. But but we we know that there's something that involves something other than our physical eyes, our physical brain. And how do we know that? And and when it says the eyes of your heart. What do the Bible writers want us to, to gather from that? What, what, are, what are we supposed to take from that? Yes, sir. Oftentimes when I hear that phrase, a lot of times it comes across as more like uh, the, the essence of who I am. That, okay, that's exactly you know, it's right. Kind of a, it's kind of an abstract thought, but it's also I think, pointed to what we're talking about for our spiritual eyes. There's, right. There's something where like, there's a deeper essence of. Who yeah, I am. so the essence of who you are, I like that. And then Carol says that it's, our, it's really who, our, who we are. I mean, it's our spiritual being. I mean, we, we, we're all... I'm sorry, go ahead. Is that your conscience? Well, it, you could say that's your conscience. I mean, the conscience is a modern word that we use to describe something that speaks to us or something that's in us. Well, that, we innately know something's right or something. Well, so there is, a, there is somewhat of an innateness. Yes. And, and, and that's kind of what I want to talk about because there are some things... That in our lives that, that can't be explained by physical, rational vision and those types of things. You know, how, how, how do you describe the origin of love? Can you see it? Can you see love? No. It, it's an emotion that we sometimes say, but you can't study it, can you? Can you put it in a lab and test it? Um, you, you can't really, you can't read it like you can a book, but where did that come from? Where did the idea of justice come from? Love, compassion, those types of things. But, but most of all of those, love. 
Did we, you know, so social scientists want us to believe that we somehow evolved to a point uh, in, the, in the world that we created that construct out of our own minds. Do you buy that? No, I, I, the Bible doesn't lend that, but the Bible talks about there being something that's, it, it, that's part of us. It's almost like it, that God's created a template that when he made you, we're all made in what way? In the image of God. So, so does the Bible talk about the fact that there is something innate in us? There is something that's in us. Maybe you could use the word conscience, um, although that can maybe ex be expressed to, to mean kind of let your, your let your let you kind of guide yourself. I mean, let your conscience be your guide is a is a wonderful Disney tune, but it doesn't always bear out that way. Um, but so we we intuitively know that we're more than flesh and blood, and if you didn't think that. If you didn't believe it, that you were more than flesh and blood, you really might as well be out on the lake or watching TV this morning or sleeping because there's no place for you here if you don't believe there's something more than flesh and blood. You're wasting your time. I mean, we're here, we're gathered together because we believe that there's something more than flesh and blood that's running through our bodies right now. Um, <clears throat> the question is, is why are so many spiritually blind and cannot see the light of God? Why is that? Is it, is it because there's a, is it because of the lack of the light of God? No. <clears throat> no. Or is it because his template that he, in, in, you know, that he placed in us is faulty? Okay. Okay. So Carol says it's our choice. We're gonna we're gonna dive into that some more. So uh, as we as we kind of introduce this idea, let's go to God in prayer and ask for Him to be with us this morning. Dear Father, we just uh, thank you so much for allowing us to be here, healthy this morning. We pray for those that are that are hurting. We pray for those that are sick, uh, but most especially, dear Father, we pray for those that are spiritually blind, that are spiritually hurting. And dear Father, there may be among us this morning that are spiritually uh, just seeking you and that need you. And dear Father, that may be walking blind. We just pray that you open our eyes. We pray that you let the word open our eyes, that the spirit fill us so that we may truly see your glory and that others can see your glory in us. Dear Father, we beg for your forgiveness because we know we let you down. We know that we've broken covenant, but we're so grateful, dear Father, that you... You pass before us and that you shed your blood for us. And we were so unworthy. We give thanks to you, dear Father, for this time we have together. We look forward to gathering together one day to worship you for an eternity, to lift up praise to you, be in your presence, and to be filled with your light uh, every day and all the time. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, <clears throat> so we, we talked about this idea of there clearly being something that's in us, that's innate. Um, there is clearly a spiritual seeing. We've talked about this the entire class that is beyond natural seeing. Okay, we've talked about a spiritual seeing that's beyond natural seeing. We've talked about a spiritual hearing that is beyond natural hearing and even a spiritual discerning that's beyond maybe natural reasoning. So um, when you look at 1 Corinthians, if you turn your Bibles there, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 through 16, um, I think this is a passage that Michael brought up to our attention a few classes back, but I want to read through these, these, these verses. Let's read together. Second, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 16. But we speak of the wisdom of God as a, in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of, uh, for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So, Jesus, so, so Paul is, is referring to the fact that there is some mystery that's been hidden. 
um, which many people could not see. What, what was it they could not see? They couldn't see Jesus. They couldn't see the glory of God because Jesus was the image and the glory of God on earth. When you saw Jesus, who did you see? You saw the Father. So, and then he says, but as it's written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us. How? Through his spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, and yes, the deep things of God. So what's, what's really hard for us sitting in this class right now, here in this time and era that we live in, it's hard for us to acknowledge that we can't maybe reach the deeper things of God on our own. Let me say that again. Don't we like to think that we have the intellectual capability and the knowledge to know the deeper things of God just through on our, by ourselves, naturally? If we did, it would be a disaster. Okay. <laughs> if we did, it would be a disaster. What, what is Paul saying here, and what is he quoting an Old Testament prophet when he says that, that, that God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man, which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except by what? Intense Bible study. That's what it says, right? No. Your translation says maybe getting a PhD or master's or MDiv. Does your translation say that? What about faithful <laughs> attendance? What's it say? Yeah, so the question is, is how does that work? Does it make you feel a little uncomfortable? It might feel a little uncomfortable because we naturally like to think that we could do it all on our own. We don't need the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God works among the people next door with the tambourines and the Spirit of God works over there, but maybe not here. <coughs> Bottom line is, is that we are told over and over there is something going on. There's something that's in us that's beyond the natural. And to really, really deeply understand the things of God and to know the things of God deeply, we need the Spirit of God. We, last time when we had class, we talked about this idea of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That that is a sin that, for which there is, no, there, is, there is no forgiveness. Remember, we, read, we talked about that passage. We mentioned the fact that if, if you've gone through your life and you've rejected God the Father and the Torah, and you've rejected Jesus while on earth, and, you've, you, you've, and then you finally, last of all, rejected the Holy Spirit, folks, you've... You've gone down a hole that you, for which you can't climb back out of. And people do that. Um, it, it is, it is, we've talked about people who it's happened to. And so spiritual blindness is a condition of the... It's a condition of the heart, but it's a condition that exists among a particular population, mostly. Okay, maybe the educated, okay. What else would you say? It's a, it's a disease that's predominantly among those, think about the New Testament, among those that are the religious. Spiritual blindness, I would say, is a condition of the religious. Why would I say that? Am I off by saying that? Am I, am I, off, am I off basis by saying that? Because don't we think all the spiritual blind people are the atheists? I can see the religious in that they do all the physical outward, but it still hasn't penetrated. Right, okay. So Carol can see the idea of the religious. Why would I say, and, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, certainly you can be not religious and have be spiritually blind, but why would spiritual blindness be a condition of the religion, of the religious? Maybe it's like a false feeling of, oh, 
Okay, yeah, so, so Nancy says that it's a sense of self-worth, a sense that I've checked the boxes. Maybe, maybe you feel ritually cleansed when in fact your heart isn't close to God. Why else would I say that? Correct me if I'm wrong. So, I mean, if I, I may, that may be, you guys just wholeheartedly agree with me. You see, like there's, there's got to be a sense of, I mean, pride in that, too. You look at the okay. Pharisees, you know, they got, they're, they're religious, but, but they know they're religious. Yeah. And, and you know, i got to be doing this right. Do we I, think, I know so Sam, do you, do you think that, that we think of ourselves as really religious? Okay, so so the problem with the Pharisees, and you pointed this out, is that I think their religiosity made them feel like that they um, that they could make it on their own, that they were going to pave their own path, and that their good works and their ritual astuteness, their ritual cleansing, all those types of things, was their path to heaven. What else? So, so one, one, of the, one of the things we've talked about is that it, to, the spiritually blind, we could say it's a condition among the religious, but it's a condition really of the proud. And, and you, all, you all that are sitting in this room know that, that sometimes the most proud people are the most religious people. You know, the, the, the people who, the, the question is, is that if you met Jesus in the first century with him wandering around teaching and healing and do this, you know, what would he look like in comparison to Pharisees? Okay, did he, he did, would you, would you look at Jesus' life and his ministry and say he's really religious? Maybe. But Jesus over and over and over again acted like a servant, right, didn't he? And he humbled himself constantly before the Father. Yes, ma'am. No, I was just looking. If you look at six or seven verses to verses one and two, it's not necessarily like I need to be established deeply in that spiritual capacity. Explain. Well, no, I mean, for us to not to know anything among you to say Jesus Christ is the truth of life. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Kim says, what I need to know is Jesus and him crucified. And to know Jesus and him crucified means that we have to acknowledge him and his glory and his divinity. And that we have to be like him. And we talked about the fact that, that to, to, if, we, if we want the spirit of God to fill us so that we can know the things of God, we have to follow Jesus and his light. We have to be in the light. And so that, that ultimately is, is living your life for, for him. So I'm going to continue this thought. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are what to him? We're, in, we're, we're still in 1 first, first Corinthians. So and what does that mean? So the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. What is this natural man he's talking about? Yes, sir? I think it's, it's, at least for me, it, it speaks to the fact that a lot of the things in Christianity, and Christ himself probably knows what doesn't, doesn't really make sense of like, why. Like, is, aren't you here to provide us your income for yourself and your, your family? Like, the, you know what I mean? Like, there's all these different things that uh, the natural man is obviously. Yeah, and a lot of times that's it's counterintuitive, is, isn't it? It's opposite a lot of times to the physical goal that we have. Anytime. Well, it's completely contradictory. Right. I mean, the world tells you, and we talked about this, we talked about the storage business. We, I mean, it's a booming business. Why is the storage business such a booming business? Because we want to hold on to things. And so um, you're, you're right. Uh, that naturally, we're inclined to want to grasp as much of the world as we can and hold on to it. Because we think that that's what brings us joy. We, we, I mean, don't you, 
Don't you, don't you think so? In Christianity, on the other hand, following after Jesus and him crucified is the opposite of that. Christ had nowhere to sleep. Yeah. So that's a big difference between him and how the Pharisees lived. I mean, Jesus lived literally a life of a, literally a nomad. And the Pharisees, of course, did not live that life. That's, that's a fascinating story. When you have spiritual eyes, you start seeing these things like, oh, I have all this money. That's probably from Satan that tempts me to move away from God. You know, if you don't have spiritual eyes, as we all know, you can misuse all of these things that God has given you for his glory. Right, right. right. Spiritual eyes can certainly, I mean, I, I think one of the litmus tests of our spiritual blindness or sight is how we spend our money and how we look at money. Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point. So let's, let's ask this question. So there are these group of people. The Romans chapter 1, verses 21 says this. And, and although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. So Paul says uh, also in 1 Corinthians 1, 21, he says, In the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. So uh, and then and I'm, I'm kind of hurrying through this idea. But, but again, it, it's, it's conveying the fact that Gentiles did not know God. It said, formerly, um, you did not know God. So the, the question is, is that, what is it in humankind that refuses to see who God is? We would call those the spiritually blind, but, but what is it, what are the hallmarks of those who maybe refuse or do not see God, like we just read these passages. The Gentiles did not know God. Um, <clears throat> but, but listen to this. So turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, verse 19 through 20. And I think this will answer the question. So there are a couple of hallmark things among those that are spiritually blind. We've talked about the causes of spiritual blindness. And I know Carol can, knows exactly all three of those. She gave them to us last time. There's the causes of spiritual blindness. But what are the hallmarks of spiritual blindness? Let's look at this passage in Romans chapter 1, verse 19 through 20. It says this. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Okay, who's he talking about? He's talking about Gentiles. He's talking about those who are not believers. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So when he says they knew God, um, you know, who's he talking about? How do we know God? The Gentiles didn't have the law, right? But they knew God. So here's what it says. So Romans chapter two, verse 14 through 15. It says, indeed, when the, when the Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things that are required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are what? They didn't know the law, but where was the law? Written in their hearts. These are people who did not know God. <clears throat> Written on their hearts, and then, and then the word Carol uses, just to use a second ago. They show that the requirements of the law are written where? On their hearts. And their conscience also bears witness. So, 
hallmarks of the spiritually blind, number one, are those people who do not acknowledge or reject him as the creator. Now, there are clearly more and more of those all the time. In fact, there are some that, uh, that do not acknowledge God as the creator that are sitting in pews on Sunday morning. And how, how is it that you can not acknowledge God as creator and be sitting in a pew on Sunday morning? Anybody know how that's possible? Yeah. It's, she said theistic evolution. It's that there is a God, but, but the world was created through naturalistic causes. In other words, it's among those in the brotherhood who actually still hold on to the idea that Darwinian evolution is true, but just orchestrated at a distance by God. So if you do not acknowledge that God is the creator, you are, that is a hallmark of spiritual blindness. Secondly, if you don't acknowledge God as the creator, as the all-powerful almighty, you will not give thanks and you will not glorify that God. Why give thanks to a God that we, that we somehow in our minds did not create the universe? Then what we're doing is creating a God for ourselves. So let's, let's go back to this, to Romans chapter 2, verse 14 to 15. So he says he's talking about this knowledge of God and the, and the laws that are written on our hearts. Can someone explain that to me? Yes, sir. So two, yeah, two fourteen, in verse fifteen, they show that the requirements of the law are written on the hearts. Their conscience also bears witness. There's a spiritual part of even those that may not know the law. Okay. So, so Michael says there's a spiritual part of us that may not know the law. So maybe, maybe going back to there's a spiritual part of men, even that even men that did not know. Yes, that's exactly right. So there's a spiritual part of men. So translate that for us today. Now, we obviously don't work and operate around the, the law of Moses. Yes? I think it, it can be explained in a certain way where when God created the world, he infused it with himself in a certain way, with his light and his goodness, and that includes human beings. And even though we're a distorted image of him, we still are an image of him. And I think you said it beautifully. I think that even though we don't know things, it's still part of us that's innate that he's created us with. That's why like we have a cosmic God. He's not just a European type, you know, only but he's he's infused himself in all things and people who don't even know him as such as they still can follow those ways that they're not gonna try to follow something else. Okay, you you're right. So there this there is an innateness, innate knowledge of God that's on our hearts. And the way I would like to think of it this morning is, is like a template. So, so God has placed his template in your heart. And, and that template is on every heart. It has a shape, it has a form that corresponds to the glory of God. So imagine that. Okay, now if that were the case, then, then you know, why is it that clearly maybe even the majority of the world does not have knowledge of God, even though that innateness is there? How does that happen? They don't seek God. They don't acknowledge him. So, so the question is, is, and I asked this at the very beginning, how is it that so many people don't see God and that are spiritually blind when we have this innate template of our of God's heart in us how is that possible if Paul says that all humans know God all humans have the work of the law written in their hearts which means that there is this God-given maybe glory shaped template in every heart that may be just waiting to receive the glory of God Yeah. Yeah. Right. So Kim is Kim is is speaking to just the universality. No matter where you're at on the planet, there is a there always has been 
this innate interest in wanting to seek out who God is. I mean, every culture. We just came back from Egypt. And, I mean, the, the question is, is what is it that's not allowing them to see God? It's almost as if there's this, this latent expectancy and longing that's buried in us to find God. Yes, Carol? Their inability to submit to God's will. They want it their way. Okay, so, so, they feel like they so maybe, maybe, and I hope I'm going to do this. This is a new, okay. Can you see that up there? That is the human heart. Can you, and, and Carol, uh, yeah, so, and, and there, there, I, I found a picture of a human heart that is, what does it look like to you? It looks dusty, okay. Uh, it's supposed to convey as a heart of stone. Uh, it, it looks rock solid. Does it look pliable to you? So, so the reason why so many people don't find the glory of God and know him is because their hearts are hard. It's, I mean, the, the reason for that is spiritual blindness. Ephesians chapter 4. This hardness... In some cases, we can, we can describe why hearts get like this. And who do we talk about? We talk about the Pharisees and Pharaoh. The Pharisees representing the most religious people, and Pharaoh representing someone who maybe thought of himself as a god. Right? Okay, so, so why is it that so many hearts are hard? and maybe even some in this room, it's because there is, in, ca in many cases, a, an aversion to God. I mean, we talked about, it's, it's, almost our, it's almost the human desire to want to stay in the dark, it's not, it's to not be exposed to the light. But it also corresponds to a self-exaltation. A self That's Pharaoh. That, that is the mindset that I can do it on my own. I can check off the boxes. My, you know, how, many, how many of you heard, well, my faith is between me and God. I, I'm, I've worked stuff out on my own, and I'm okay. Don't worry, I, I don't need to go to church. How many people, how many times have you heard, I don't need organized religion? Okay, yeah, so it's this, it's, it's, it's honestly exactly what Pharaoh said. I am God, I know the gods, I'm the son of a god, so I can work things out my own way. I don't need any help. I don't need the spirit. I don't need the word. I, I can just make my own path. Folks, that's what that heart looks like. And here's the thing. That heart can sit with a tie and a nice jacket on in a pew. Yes, sir. So I think the challenge is what Pharaoh teaches us, I think, part of what Pharaoh teaches us is presented with evidence, he got harder. Yes, that's easy. Yes. And so what is the solution if, you know, what do you what do you what do you do with that person, right? That, that you know in your life if if evidence only deepens the issue. Yeah. So when, when the scripture says that Pharaoh hardened his heart and that God hardened his heart, um, God basically is saying, um, I'm going to let you harden your heart. I mean, here, here's the thing. It, it is, even though the innateness of goodness and, and love and those types of things, the innateness of God is in us, does that mean he's not going to let you just become so hardened that a jackhammer can't? And fix you. Yes. On down Romans chapter one there and twenty four, we see what happened there. God gave them up. He yes. Them up. Same cons. Yes. Yeah. So does that mean that that you have no way back? Um, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that you've made the path almost impossible to come back. I mean, you know, that that's the idea. The, the idea he's he's given us up to our own. Our own desires and, and, and our own path. Yes. I think a lot of times we see it's also a fault in the key as well as the simple brother. We see you see the expression get the moment of Satan so that yes. you might be kind yeah. of uh, trial in a way to, to turn back kind of like the uh, the, the uh, son that it was, you know, in the parable that Jesus doesn't like. But it's just the idea that 
did the social <laughs> sense of desires so that then I could actually use to a sense of the whole idea of how you know, letting someone hit rock bottom before they yeah, yeah, rock yeah, rock bottom, yeah, that's, that's right. Um, you know, it reminds me of Peter. You know, Peter, in one moment of, of brilliant clarity, spiritual sight, tells Jesus what? He says, you are the son of the living God. And, um, and then just a few sentences later, Jesus rebukes him, and what's he tell him? Get behind me, Satan. What happened? So how many of you can go to spiritual heights in one moment and spiritual clarity and then basically be spiritually blind to the point where you're rebuked to get behind me, Satan? How can that happen? Can, can that happen to us? <laughs> in one moment of spiritual brilliant light is in us and then the second minute we walk off, we're out of the light and we just become spiritually blind. That's exactly right. Peter, Peter is a perfect example of someone who has, is walking on the water one minute and then is sinking the next minute. I think part of, you know, you've already mentioned some, right there in Romans 1, part of what happens is worship the creature rather than the creator. I'm on first day, something to do there. Um, very easy to take your eyes off God, off the things that have been created. People worship things, people worship countries, people worship things that have been created rather than the creator and take your eyes off God. And that just uh, speeds up the process of hardening. Yeah. Because you're worshiping something, I mean, you're, you're all in on something, but it's just, you know, say you've been able to divert your attention. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, that's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a perfect image of, of Peter walking in the water with his eyes on Jesus. And when his eyes are on Jesus, and he's not paying attention to what Jesus created. The winds, the storm, the trial, all those things. When he begins to focus on the created, he, that's when he really takes his eyes off Jesus. And he begins to sing. So, so we talk about this template. Okay, this is an analogy that I'm using. Okay, so just bear with me. But this template, this idea that God has given us a template. And, and it's a, you know, it's... it's they're, they're kind of, it's a shape that is hollowed out. And we, it's, it's perfectly shaped to hold the brilliance and glory of God. I mean, it's, it's like an empty, there's an empty space there in our hearts in that template that's waiting for God. It's like the perfect puzzle piece that goes right in. And when you have that perfect puzzle piece, that's when you receive joy and, and light and, and so there is this hollowness that's waiting to be filled with the glory of God. So when the glory of God shines in there, it's, it, it fits perfectly. And, and that's, that's our Christian life, is, is not filling that empty void with stuff that's not him. Yeah, so, so Nancy says you have to nurture this, and there's going to be moments where it's filled with the glory of God, and then just like we talked about with Peter, the next moment it can be filled with corruption. And so, to, so again, to the, to the natural mind, the mind is, is, again, or the heart we're talking about, the mind, the heart, we're kind of using this analogy. Again, there's this glory-shaped mold, and, and it can be filled with idols, it, it can be filled with stuff. And, and that it, it can be filled with a glory of foolishness. It won't fit, but we try to jam it in. I mean, I, I think the perfect example is, is some, sometimes, again, how many, how many people, when they fill an emptiness in their life, try to fill it with self-help remedies? What are you saying when you have this emptiness in your life that may just, and it, it just you feel unquenched, you feel unsatisfied, 
And, and you think, well, surely some other person has the answer. Because what they, what they perceive is they, they perceive the people on yachts and that are happy and their families look perfect. And, and, the, and they think, well, that guy has the answer. This person has the answer. So, I mean, think about, we talked about the storage business. You know another really good business? It's the self-help business. Think about that. I mean, how many books are there written about how you can find the remedy for the emptiness in your life on your own? Any, uh, listen, I, I'm not going to judge you. I probably, I may have something in my library. I, I, I hope not, but I'm not, no one's judging you if you have something in your library, but I will tell you right now, you're looking in the wrong place. The only person, the only thing that will fill your heart to where you are just, you are satisfied and there's true joy is Jesus and him crucified and him resurrected. He is the light. In him is no darkness. So when we think about hearts of stone, um, you know, and we think of this, most people right now are walking around like this. It's, a, it's an eye that is basically just full of a massive cataract. I can't see. And so what we have to do is we have to, um, we, we can't love the darkness. We can't, we can't keep looking for self-help solutions. We can't, so again, God can cut away and, and create this beautiful heart, but we can, you know, we can fill our hearts with so much packed stuff that you can't fit anything else in it. How many of you have done that? You know, I just came back from a trip and Kim probably already knows the answer. I filled my suitcase where I could not possibly get one more thing in it. You can fill your heart and your life with so much junk and material things that you just can't pack anything else spiritual in it. Um, God can cut away that if we're willing to get rid of the stuff. When we allow the light of his word to fill us, the glory of God can cut and burn and melt all that stuff away. That is, if we have the Understanding, if, as long as we understand that, that we have to submit. Yes, ma'am. I think in Romans, the first chapter, verse 25, um, Michael talks about the second half of the verse, the first part, part where it says they exchange the truth of God for a lie. Oh. And I just think about, like, isn't that what we do? Like, when we stop believing, like, what is true about God, sometimes because of past hurts where we, you know, you have a father who abandoned you. God as a father. So things like that that distort what is actually true about God. When we stop believing what is true, then we turn to these other things, thinking they're going to make us happy, thinking they can fill us. And like we've been talking about with religious people, like we do that with religious things that we think we can do it, that mm. we can strive and strive, and that is what's going to get us to heaven. As opposed to Jesus already did it. And so letting, and they gave us, we have God's spirit in us. And again, that feeling, like, I feel like it just follows Michael's class about the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Like, you talk about that true joy. That true joy comes from the spirit in us that we allow to fill us. But the only way that happens is if you leave room for that spirit. That's beautifully said. And I love this idea of, of the idea that we, our view of God is so easily distorted. And, and who distorts that view of God? He does every day. That's a beautifully well said. And I, I, that is, again, a whole class on how the, how, that's a, again, it's an interesting topic too. How the view, of, how our view of God become so, can become so easily distorted. John. He was right there. And they were surrounded by 
his blessings and everything that he had done, but Satan, as he does with us, whispering in their ears, appealing to bless the eyes, bless the flesh, and drop Yeah. And that's and, what and, so easily distracts us. And Satan's distortion of Eve, Satan's distortion of Eve was that you can become like that of God. And and God I don't doesn't want you. Yeah. God is holding you back. God's holding you back. Well, that's well said, yeah. And, and boy, does that not happen today? I mean, it's just this, this idea that you can determine what's real, really right and wrong. You don't need a God to tell you that because you know that. I mean, talk about self-help books. I think there's the name of a book that is Find the God Within Yourself. I mean, I'm sure that title is somewhere out there, right? Find the God within yourself. That is exactly what Satan told Eve she could do, is that you could be the God to determine what's right and wrong. Excellent comments. Wonderful class. Thank you so much. I got a lot out of this. See you all Sunday. Thank you.